Thank you very much, Mr. Schmidt. Uh, I thought, I think it's astonishing in a sense what transition we have made in the last five years to a situation now which he described as being one of the big spenders of national development agencies where hundreds if not thousands of millions of dollars are now being brought to bear on the challenge of adaptation. Whereas a few years ago, we had barely made the argument that adaptation was necessary. It's, it has surprised me, and I salute those who are involved in this. But the capacities and the vulnerabilities and the scientific knowledge that Wolfgang Schmidt was talking about is based upon your work. You know, your work on the social dimensions of global change underpin all this. It, it's a hugely important task. Well, there's another big player in uh, the meeting the challenge through adaptation to climate change, an institutional, um, international institution, the World Bank. Within that World Bank, there is a social development department. And within that bank, uh, work that social development department is a team that works on the social dimensions of climate change. And Robin Mears is lead specialist and team leader of that team working on the social dimensions of climate change within the social development department, within that big edifice, uh, the World Bank. And he's going to speak on equity and social justice in response to climate change in developing countries, from principles to practice. Robin. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a real honor and a privilege to be a part of this panel today. Uh, and particularly my good friend here, uh, Ambassador Decima Williams, uh, to see her as part of the panel also. Uh, we had a, a roundtable discussion in the World Bank just last week on exactly this theme of equity and climate change, in which uh, Decima Williams was a, a featured speaker. Uh, so it's a pleasure to, to see her again today. The World Bank has been involved in, in supporting efforts to uh, promote low carbon growth and support adaptation to climate change for a number of years. But it's really only the, over the last 18 months or so that efforts have ramped up very significantly to look at how to integrate responses to climate change in all the development work, virtually all the development work that the World Bank is promoting with client uh, country governments around the world. And over the last year or so, uh, the bank has developed what's called a strategic framework on development and climate change uh, not unlike the, uh, the OECD uh, DAT guidance. Uh, you can find this on the World Bank's um, website. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is, as Martin mentioned, the, particularly how we're addressing this as a social development issue. We held a, uh, an international conference about a year ago in order to launch and frame this set of issues. And what we determined was that climate change is fundamentally an issue of social justice. And I'd like to just frame some of these issues uh, in order to get into the discussion today. Uh, this is really a summary of some of the key messages that I'd like to touch on uh, in, in the next 10 minutes or so. But put very simply, inequity and injustice in the distribution of the causes and the consequences of climate change call for equity and social justice in responses to climate change uh, within developing countries as well as between the global north and the global south. Uh, as we've heard very eloquently from uh, Wolfgang Schmick just now, uh, it's the poorest, uh, the poorest people who suffer first and most. The most vulnerable are also, of course, the least responsible for the causes of climate change. Now, I'm going to touch on aspects of both substantive and procedural equity, um, or rights. So in other words, that we're very concerned with the outcomes, uh, outcomes that would reduce the vulnerability of the poorest, uh, but we're also uh, interested in, in approaches to responding to that, to empower the poor and vulnerable groups to engage in national level policy processes in order to set priorities at the national level uh, and, and combat climate change, adapt to climate change in ways that are particularly pro-poor. So I want to stress both these substantive and procedural dimensions. Now let me move fairly quickly through what might be a very familiar story to some of you. Um, and we're looking first at global greenhouse gas emissions and their distribution across countries uh, at the global level. Um, and what this is showing is on a country by country basis, what's the, the, the very stark differences in per capita emissions 
And of course, there are countries uh, such as Australia, uh, the US, and Canada with per capita emissions of around 20 tons uh, of CO2 equivalent uh, per capita per year, compared with, at the other end of the spectrum, negligible emissions uh, per capita from Ethiopia, um, from Mozambique, and so on, uh, with, a, with an array in between. But by and large, the high income average is somewhere around 14 tons per capita. This is based on 2006 data. Middle-income countries at around four, low-income countries at less than one ton per capita. A fundamental inequity. If we turn to taking population into account, and here the columns are scaled according to the population of the countries concerned, uh, to make the point that the proportion of the world's population um, in, in developing countries is considerably larger and, of course, emitting much lower on a per capita basis. As we heard yesterday from uh, Ernst von Weizsäcker, uh, if we take cumulative historical per capita emissions into account, uh, according to some of the proposals from, for example, China, then those inequities come out even more starkly indeed. Let's turn now to impacts and the challenges of adaptation. Um, and again, Wolfgang Schmidt has really outlined these uh, in, a, in a very comprehensive way. I simply want to illustrate the point with this chart. Here we see on the left-hand side um, uh, a cartogram of the world scaled according to GDP per capita. And on the right-hand side, by contrast, um, using the MDAT database on mortality from extreme events, from extreme uh, climate-related events, uh, we see the proportion of uh, those killed from natural disasters um, in the global south far, far outweighing those in the global north. Uh, so there's a, a mirror image there in terms of these images. We know from Bangladesh, um, mortality from Cyclone Sidr um, earlier this decade uh, saw mortality of orders of magnitude lower than uh, cyclone events in previous decades, going back to the 1970s. 3,000 deaths, which is still obviously tragic um, and uh, needs to be avoided, rather than the 300,000 deaths from the 1970s. Why? Well, Strong efforts and preparedness on the part of communities, civil society organizations, and local authorities, but with very strong public support from the central government uh, in it playing an enabling role. We've been doing some work in the social development department to develop uh, so-called indices of social development to try to capture what are the dimensions of robust institutions at the societal level that contribute to um, pr better preparedness, better adaptive capacity in the face of climate change and extreme events. Uh, and we do see a close correlation, um, as we see in this cartogram today. Uh, the, the paper I'm referring to is prepared as a background paper for the next World Development Report, which is going to be on development and climate change in a few months' time. Uh, and that's available, uh, the background paper is available on our website. And I'll give you the address at the end. Putting both of these together, uh, this is a, a slide that uh, Bob Watson, another former chair of the IPCC, um, likes to show, which is, again, showing th the differences between uh, the largest per capita emissions in the, in the global north and those most vulnerable to the effects of climate change in the global south. And as I drove here this morning along Wooly Brandstrasse, uh, I was very much reminded of the map on the front of the Brandt Report in 1980, which looks not unlike this. This climate change represents the global inequities uh, uh, which are fundamentally about development. So what does equity mean in this global context? Well, equity is enshrined in the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in Article 3 under this phrase, common but differentiated responsibility. And the issue really is, how is the burden of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to be shared equitably, fairly among nations, taking into account uh, historical emissions and responsibility? Uh, but secondly and fundamentally, how are adaptation efforts to be supported for those who are most vulnerable to the effects uh, and for whom these, these changes are now uh, unavoidable and many worse changes are to come if concerted effort on the mitigation side is not achieved. So really both of these, these twin dimensions, are the cornerstone of global efforts to reach a fair deal in Copenhagen.